Good morning, everyone. We are just waiting uh, a, for a couple more people to join us. Thank you for joining us on day three of Introduction to Government Procurement. Okay. <clears throat> all right, so I'm gonna start with our words of introduction. I wish you all a great morning on the welcome to Southeast PA PTAC day three of the government procurement readiness series. I see some of our uh, repeat entities from day one and day two. I appreciate you coming back to learn more. So I apologize if some of it sounds redundant, but for the benefit of those who are just join, joining us today, I would just like to let you know uh, what PTAG does. Uh, we are a procurement technical assistance center and our mission is to assist businesses in learning how to be successful selling to government agencies, whether federal, state, or local, through seminars like this one and one-on-one uh, -on -one counseling. We are funded by a cooperative agreement with the Defense Logistics Agency and all of our services are free of charge. There are more than 300 locations nationwide offering the same kind of assistance, and our Southeast PA office serves the following counties. Berks, Bucks, Chester, Delaware, Lehigh, Montgomery, Northampton, and Philadelphia counties. My name is Natasha Borchanin. I am the program manager and government marketing specialist, and I'd like to initiate the first in this, uh, actually the third in this week's series, where we will discuss is my business viable and how do, to do market research. Our guide through this session today is my colleague and government marketing specialist, Bruce Downing. Bruce has over 30 years of experience in business and education and has served as an executive in a number of IT companies. He utilizes his experience starting of four businesses in the IT service sector, all of which obtain government contracts. We are lucky to have Bruce as a part of our team uh, to help support small businesses with their government procurement journey. If you have any questions as you are listening to this presentation, feel free to put them in chat. And uh, we usually have time to answer them all at the end of the session. It is my pleasure to introduce Bruce. And Bruce, uh, you are welcome to take it over from here. Thank you, Nata Chef. Um, for those of you who are joining us again, you know we have started talking about some of the requirements for government contracting. And um, this morning, what I want to do is to give you just a taste of some of the research sites where you can start finding information about agencies and your competition. So again, what we have been emphasizing in, in all of our uh, uh, talks about your marketing strategy to get into government marketing is that you need to be able to look at sources of past contracts and sources for new existing bid opportunities. So I want to emphasize today just one tool uh, that um, we can help you learn about. And again, as I have said in past sessions, um, anything we talk about here today, uh, we can help you with. So if you haven't signed up as a as a client of the of a PTAC yet, uh, I would recommend that you do so. And as Natasha said, all of our services are free of charge. So in doing research, <clears throat> you really wanna be looking at, first of all, what agencies buy what you sell and who is your competition? I mean, obviously you wanna know who to talk to in federal government. One of our themes is that the best way to get contracts is develop relationships with the people and agencies that actually set the requirements. And also to know who your competition is, because sometimes your competition you can partner with, or people getting the contracts might be prime contractors that need you as a subcontractor. So based on the research you do, you can decide on your best strategy for getting in touch with people finding the offices that write the business for you. So we'll look at, basically today, we'll talk about three sources of research that are important. I'll really focus mostly on a one system looking for past contracting information so that you can at least size your opportunities. 
what agencies actually buy what you sell. Um, so a second source is current opportunities. And we'll be talking a little bit about how you're going to find those. And then forecasts, forecasts, agency forecasts uh, can actually show you what they plan to buy in the future. So based on your research, you then go ahead and implement your strategy to find agencies and prime contractors you can work with. Those are going to be your prospects that you want to go after. So I'm going to highlight today the federal procurement data system. This is to find procurement histories where you're going to identify those agencies and vendors that you want to work with. And this is not the only system, but this is the system where all transactions between federal government agencies and vendors are recorded. So this data system is actually used by other uh, engines you'll find out there. Some of my colleagues and others like to use a, a site called Fed Spending. Uh, Fed Spending is uh, it's good from a user standpoint from the front end, but it doesn't drill down as easily to all of the data you want to look at. And I know this is going to be a little bit uh, complicated and somewhat um, daunting when you look at this. But again, as I said before, when, we, when you really get to be procurement ready and have a good idea of your codes and things like that, then we can work with you one-on-one -on -one in a Zoom session like this to look specifically for the data for your company. So here is the contract histories in the federal procurement data system. So when you log into fpds.gov, this is the kind of a screen you'll see. And the login is based on your login.gov credentials. So the login.gov user ID and password that you use, it gets you into the SAM system to register your entity. It also allows you into this kind of a system to uh, get the information. Now you will see in SAM and other places, uh, information like this, that the FPDS reports module is now retired and is on SAM.gov. Uh, well, what they've done is in the FPDS system, they've got some what they call uh, historic uh, data. They have existing search uh, parameters in there. Um, it's kind of a, a help to you, uh, but it does not get you down to the full data set. So today we're going to actually go in here and look at FPDS. We're not going to go to SAM because we're going to drill right down into the whole data set on FPDS. And again, this is all free to you. So when you get into FPDS and you're logged in, the place you want to go is Easy Search. Now, as I said, there's ad hoc reports you can create. There are standard reports they have, a whole bunch of stuff. These report types now are what's on the SAM system. But what we're going to do is we're going to click on Easy Search. And when you click on Easy Search, you get this kind of a, a page. Now, you'll see over here, it will say that this section has recent searches. So if you get lost or navigating this, you can't get back in. All you got to do is go back into the beginning where you log in and go back into the system. And then your recent searches will be right there. So you can go right back to where you were. But what we're going to do is we're going to start with advanced search. Now, you could put in some keywords, something that, you know, like a product name or something. But that's going to give you anything that, uh, that those words match in this system. And it's not generally the best way to start. So we're going to start with advanced search so I can show you how this system works for searching. And when we go to advanced search, this box pops up and it says search within results or put in a new search. Well, basically what's going to happen is as you add criteria, that is search things you want to look for, uh, what that means is that you're going to be narrowing down the results based upon those key things that you put in. So what you want to do is after you've gone to advanced search, this pops up, you click on add. 
And when you click on add, it opens up a drop down box with all of the things that you could actually search on. <clears throat> so again, if you know anything about like data searches using databases, uh, when you add a search criterion, what it does is it narrows down the number of things you're going to see based on what you've put in there as a search uh, parameter. So now, and you can see there's just lots and lots and lots in here. But what we'd usually say the typical research uh, criteria, the data fields, you can start with your NAICS code. And I hope you uh, all know what a NAICS code is. I'm not going to go into that now, but we've covered that. That's your, your uh, basic industry code. PSC codes, we've introduced those. That's a product service code. It's another set of codes that the government uses. And usually PSC codes are a little narrower and a little easier to use. You can then look at date signed. And this is the date that the contract was signed by both the government and the vendor. That's when, the, that's when it became an official award. And the reason you wanna do that is because some of this data that you will see, if you don't narrow it down by the date here, you know there are thousands of records. Some of them go back to the 1970s. So the reason you want to put in a date signed is because you want to narrow it down to say, okay, well, what action was here for, let's say, just this year? You know, uh, how many awards and stuff were made under this PFC code uh, during this time period? So the date signed is something you can use. And when you click on date signed, when, when you click that add and the drop down box, you click on date signed and it gives you the two dates to put in, the beginning date and the end date. You can also put in a description of the requirement. Now, unfortunately, uh, they don't usually put in a really detailed requirement definition in this, in this database, uh, but you might find some key words that you wanna look at and put it in you know, the description of requirement. That's, that's something that sometimes is helpful. Place of performance, if you're only looking at things that you want to do in Pennsylvania or Delaware or something like that, the place of performance is when the contract is put in, it says, where is that work going to be performed? Now, a lot of times uh, it's not going to be on the government site. It's going to actually be on the vendor site too. So, you know, that's another thing people want to search for. So I'm going to go into now an example here that we did for a container manufacturer uh, who was one of our clients, and this is a this is this is a, a little old uh, because we did this back in uh, 2019 February. And so what we did was I put in a NAICS code. Uh, this this uh, manufacturer makes metal boxes and containers and things that uh, you know even some big ones or ammunition boxes. A lot of those kinds of things. So I put in the NAICS code of 332439, which is for metal containers. During the period from January 1st of 2018 to February 16th, which was the date I did this in 2019. And the PSC code, which you see is 8140, that's boxes and containers. So, um, you know, the combination of the NAICS code and the PSC code really narrows it down to metal containers and boxes. So. so when I put that in and hit the search button, this is what I come up with. Now you will notice that um, up at the top here, it says this is the list of contract actions matching your criteria. So there was 93 matches in what I just searched for in that time period. And you'll notice up here too, that it's giving you the list of things that you've put in there. And they are also over here, your search criteria. And you'll notice over here, there's a little X. So if I wanted to take that NAICS code out, I could click that little X and it would just be looking for the date sign in the PSC code. So you can control all of that. You can also control the sort order. Now, this database will record if there's a new contract that's issued, if there's a purchase order against an existing contract, 
uh, if there is some action of changing categories of costs or something, they, so they have to modify the award a little bit, any action on that uh, gives you uh, a record in here. Now, another thing I want to point out is notice that anything in blue, if you click on anything in blue, it will take you to the subset of actions just for that. So you notice up in this one, the vendor is Conco Incorporated. Now notice over here, the action obligation is the amount of money that this transaction uh, used. Uh, it's called the action obligation. And you'll notice it's a negative uh, $133,864. Well, that's probably because they just changed some of the requirements and changed funding uh, buckets. Um, but if I wanted to look at just everything in Department of the Army, I could click on that and it would take me to only the Army stuff. Um, so if I wanted to look at Conco and everything they've got, so if you know that was a a uh, uh, competitor of yours, you could click on that and give give you everything they've got in that period. Now notice also on the on the left hand side, uh, department full names, but you, those are not as useful as the contracting agency name. So you will see here under contracting Navy, it has uh, I think you can see that on your screen. I hope it says thirty four behind Department of Navy. That says that as out of this 93, 34 of the actions are Department of Navy. So if you only wanted to see what was under this with Department of Navy, it's in blue, so I can click on that. It tells you the top 10 vendors. That's not all of the vendors, but these are the biggest ones getting the most action. And um, CBOX is over in New Jersey, and they just happen to be a competitor of uh, this client I was working with. Uh, so that was, you know, this is the first uh, look at what's in there. Uh, now we're going to keep coming back to this and show you how to use it uh, as we go on. And as I said, I know this is a little confusing uh, and we can help you go through this together. <clears throat> okay, now what I did next was I said, because there were some negatives in there and things, you really only kind of interested maybe in the top ones. So I was able to go in here and sort descending, that is from high to low, sort on action obligation. And what that did for me was show me that this one here, a B-Way Corporation, got one for 12 million and some, all right? I mentioned C-Box. Well, C-Box is one of their competitors, as I said, and we're gonna go in and if you hit on the view button for any of these records, you see there's a view here, view here, a view here. When you click on view, that takes you to three additional pages of information. So I clicked on view in this record, and here we go. So this tells you a lot of information. And again, this is good education for you as to how government contracts are done. Uh, you will start understanding what some of these numbers mean, and you can use them to your advantage. So the, this was a delivery or task order. So they're going to be talking. This is something that was supposed to be delivered under uh, a current contract. Um, there will be sometimes this will just be new contract, sometimes their award. Uh, so you'll, you'll see what kind of a posting they put it in. Now down here, it gives you the agency code, and we, we actually have a uh, spreadsheet of agency codes uh, so that if you really want to find out more about this agency and, and the contracting office, we can work on that. But the procurement identifiers, the award ID is this particular action, and this is their ID number for that action. The reference ID uh, is the um, actual contract number itself. And so sometimes what you'll see is that th there will be a repeating contract number, but new award numbers. So that's their numbering system. Again, uh, don't be too concerned about that right now because we can help take you through that. 
But here is very interesting uh, information on the date signed. It says here that it was signed in June of 2018 and it goes out to 2023. So this is still a current contract out there. And one of the good strategies that we'll be talking about is to go in and find um, the ultimate completion dates or the completion dates to and put in a date range. Again, these are things you can search on in that drop-down box. So you can use that drop-down box as we showed you at the beginning. And one of the things you can click on is completion date. And maybe you put the completion date in the date range from today to let's say two years out. So you can see which ones are coming up for award again, or possibly have to put out a new solicitation. So this will tell you when some contracts are ending and you might then have an opportunity to get in touch with this agency and see if they're gonna put out another bid on it. So talking about the contracting agency, here's their agency ID number, here's contracting office ID number, this is the name, this is the Department of Air Force. Um, I have no idea what this is, that's their nomenclatures. Um, and the funding office, uh, don't really know what that is either, uh, but we can look up this stuff. And again, by looking at the contracting office ID number, it will tell you who they are and where they are located. It will not give you contact people to call or anything like that. Now, again, in action obligation, it's only giving you uh, the total amount that is obligated by the government over the life of this contract. Uh, you will see in some of these that maybe the action obligation for this particular action was uh, $2 million, but the base and all option contract values might be $4 million. So what that's saying that this particular action was only $2 million worth of a purchase order against a contract that has a higher value. So this is, you know, good information. And again, as you get into this, you know, we can go through it with you to, you know, understand what's going on in your world. Uh, here is information about the winning vendor. There's their DUNS number. Now this is going to be changed to UEI numbers, their cage code. Uh, and if you wanted to check and see if you could do business with these folks, your cage code is right in here. So you can actually go look them up in SAM and see who their contact information is for government contracting. Okay, so then the next page, the final page here, this um, shows again, this is the and then the business category, this tells you what category they are in uh, when they registered in SAM. Down here, the type of contract is the firm fixed price contract. Um, it says it's a, not a multi-year contract, but uh, you know the final uh, deliveries are down the road. Um, only one action. Um, so in here, the per principal place of performance is actually going to be at their plant because that's where they're going to manufacture what they're going to deliver. And then finally, as I said, this sort of gives you the product service code description again, NAICS code. Um, and down here, this is a description of the requirement. Now notice that there is nowhere in here and you're not gonna find it in any of these systems, the actual line item price. It's not gonna tell you how many of their widgets or their boxes they bought at what price each. That you can only get by getting to the actual contract itself. And the only way to do that is through a Freedom of Information Act request to the agency to see the contract. Uh, but that takes time. So, <clears throat> all right. Now, down here, it tells you that it was a small business set aside. So it was issued as a small business set aside. And you should by now know what that means. It says there were five offers. And um, 
probably uh, more than one contract was issued. Could be they they actually issued a contract to each of the five. So we don't know by this information. Okay, so now we're back to the beginning here. And as I said, that's, you know, that just gives you a snapshot. It gives you a lot of information simply by going through and talking about what all those pieces of information are. So you understand how all this works. Um, you know, that that is a good education in and of itself. But as I've said many times, and we'll continue to say in the rest of our sessions here, your best bet for getting a contract is to get in touch with the people in an agency who set the requirements. And that's not always a contracting officer. But once you, but what you're going to be using this system for is, first of all, based on your codes uh, and other information you want to put in there, you will find out who are the top agencies writing the business. And that right there should be an indicator to you where to start. So we want to drill down into these top agencies, find out what offices in the Navy are buying these things, find out through the small business office of the Navy and other resources who you might talk to about this. So remember, every agency has a small business utilization officer who's supposed to help, or their staff is supposed to help you navigate this. And if you already have yourself armed with good information so that you can ask a specific question of those people, you're going to be a lot more successful getting the information. So you might reach out to them and say, I've noticed that such and such a naval office is buying A, B, and C on a regular basis. And I do that kind of work. Can you help me figure out who I should be getting in touch with in this particular office to make myself known to them? So again, that's the purpose of all of this stuff is to find out who are the agencies, and then who are the top people? Uh, I've also uh, kind of uh, emphasized understanding your supply chain. So maybe you have something that you're not going to sell directly to the government, but maybe sell it to vendors who are putting together things that your offering would be a part of, or in services. You know, if you find vendors that are getting uh, top service dollars for providing some kind of consulting service or whatever, you might wanna get in touch with them and introduce yourself to them as someone who can do that kind of work if they get short of staff. So again, you know, there's a lot of things that you'll get out of this. Now I've emphasized in this demonstration today, only a product, but the whole thing of services works the same way. So you can put in the NAICS and PSC codes, the kind of services you want to see, and drill down uh, to get some information on that. Now, <clears throat> OK, so you've got these 91 records up here. And let's say you want to save these records so that you can go back to these. Well, up here, you can export the data by clicking on this CSV. Now, CSV stands for comma separated variables, and that's what's created in an Excel spreadsheet. So if you click on CSV at this point, what you will get is a express, a, a, an Excel spreadsheet, and each row is going to be the information in this particular box. Then the next row is this box, the next row is this box. And each of the columns are going to be these headers. So the award ID, the vendor name, all of these are headers. And each record here is a row. So what you're going to get is this top level information um, right away. And again, here's your reference ID. That's contract number there. Uh, and who the contracting office was. So this gives you records of this that you can then go sort yourself in, in your Excel spreadsheet. You can sort this uh, based on the vendor, based on the uh, Department of Army versus the Air Force, et cetera. 
So you can use this to kind of navigate and then keep records. Because a lot of times what I used to do with this, this kind of stuff is, is I would create extra, extra columns to the, to the right of this information, be able to sort it, take a look at this stuff, and then put in that extra columns contact information that I find. Uh, put in other information uh, to keep a, a running sort of contact list, a prospecting list, if you will. So again, this data is the best source for past contracting actions. Okay, the other thing we've emphasized is, okay, so you look at past opportunities to see, you know, who really... Uh, is giving the business and who's getting the business, who are the vendors at your competition. And the next thing you want to be able to do is find current opportunities. Now, Sam has this part over here, contract opportunities. And again, your counselor can go through you through with you um, how to use this information. And when you get information on new contracts, there, you know, if if it's over $25,000 in value, it must be posted in this FBO contracts opportunity on SAM. So anything over $25,000 gets posted there. If it's not over $25,000, it may be in other sources of information. Looking for procurement forecasts is another good strategy. This is a GSA site. It's called acquisition.gov. And there's a lot of different information that GSA publishes, but this I clicked on the agency procurement forecast. What this gives you is on the left-hand side, it gives you the agency's main homepages. So if I want to find out more about the Department of Agriculture, I could just click on this and it would take me directly to information on Department of Agriculture. Now, why would you maybe do that? Well, first of all, you know, you can look through their website to find who the small business people might be that you would want to contact. Um, you know, you, you might know that there's a particular office under the Department of Agriculture that you want to work with based on your research. Well, you could, you know, drill down on their on their basic website and get more information about the Department of Agriculture. On the right-hand side, though, is for each agency, there is a possibly a procurement forecast. So if I wanted to see what uh, the Agriculture Department is forecasting they're going to be purchasing, let's say, the next three years, and, and generally, it would be actually starting in the, the current year. And each of these procurement forecast sites uh, work differently. Some of them just have a master uh, Excel spreadsheet that you can download and look at. Um, some of them, and many of them now, particularly in the Department of Defense and others, they're getting very sophisticated where you can search on your NAICS code, you can search on a lot of other parameters and drill down to get uh, procurement forecasts. And the real advantage of this is not only to get some sense of what they think they're going to be buying, uh, but in general, when they have a category, it's going to be by a program that they have. So Department of Defense, you know, under there, you may see that they're going to have a procurement forecast for Navy submarines or some, some big projects there and lots of different classes under that. Uh, so there's going to be different people within these agencies who are responsible for different programs. And, you know, they're the ones that set the requirements. They're the budget folks. And quite often, the agency procurement forecast will have listed the person who is responsible for that program. So if they list that person, they will have contact information for the people you really want to be talking to. So not all agencies do a good job of the procurement forecast. And there's a couple of other sites, particularly a DOD has another site, which has uh, uh, other procurement forecasts GSA does a lot of that too. Again, talk to your counselor when you know about these recurring procurement forecasts and the different sources for those. This is probably one of the best. And of course, GSA gets involved in everything in procurement nowadays. So uh, they probably have the most information. 
Okay, and then don't forget our bid match service is open to you at no charge. We develop this search profile based on your codes, but most importantly, your keywords. Now, as you go through, um, you know, your searches and everything for past contracts, you can get a good idea, you know, of maybe some of the keywords you might want to use. But what happens is it searches every day for new opportunities for you to bid on, and it sends you an email with links to those new opportunities, including the Fed biz ops on SAM. So you need to understand how to use that SAM system, but this system is going to send you every day new opportunities that come up on Fed biz ops. Again, though, those might only be over $25,000 and they may not get out to Fed biz ops. So they might be on other systems. So this is just a partial list of the, some of the uh, sites it looks at. It actually looks at, you know, probably 20 to 30 different databases. And again, your bid match service gives you state and local opportunities if you want that also. So if you want to look at, uh, say, Pennsylvania, New Jersey, Delaware, what the states are buying, this system does that for you too. Now, just be aware that you, you know, to get this free, you need to go through your counselor. You can't go directly to it unless you want to pay a big fee and get your own account. But we buy an account uh, in our system uh, that we use then for the benefit of our clients. But it will send you every day bid opportunities based upon the profile we develop with you. Uh, and again, mostly on keywords. So, you know, you want to, you're going to be putting keywords in for a lot of different things, including your SAM registration and all. So you need to be starting to think about keywords that describe what you offer right now. Okay, so a summary of what we've gone through before we answer questions here. You're going to first look at past contracts to find agencies and prime contractors that you're going to use to develop your list of prospects. Going in this FPDS uh, system is going to help you understand how purchasing is organized and managed. You will see the contract types in there. Uh, sometimes if it's a recent contract too in the FPDS, it will still have the original solicitation number in there, and it may still be in the SAM archives, and you might find the, the actual original solicitation of what they were asking for. It also helps you learn about your competition. You know, who are the, who are the folks that are out there? Looking for new bid opportunities, you're gonna be using that Fed biz ops, researching the procurement forecasts, Use our bid match program to uh, help you find that. And then go into each of the agency websites for those agencies you've identified through doing your research on past contracts. Uh, so the agencies, you want to get to know their sub offices. You want to get to know how they're organized. Find out where their small business uh, support people contacts are. And that's what you're going to be doing. So. Again, this is kind of our research summary. Uh, we'll come back to this in our final session on, uh, we're gonna be sort of summarizing all of this to help you develop your marketing strategy using some of this information. Okay. Um, and just to piggyback on that, Bruce, like the agency websites may also list any upcoming networking events. Right. I, I really encourage people, whether it's virtual or in person, and you have identified that that is the agency that you want to work with, to really show up and have your capability statements ready. You know, just like anything else in life, this face-to-face -face contact, uh, you know, uh, does a lot to help, you know, all the digital work that you have already done to get here. Right, right. Mm -hmm. Okay, so questions. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> there was a lot of quite specific information relative to search and uh, does anyone have any questions for the benefit of the group now is the time i know it might seem overwhelming but <laughs> <laughs> yeah 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 this government contracting i often say uh, the 
working with your counselor is like trying to drink from a fire hose. <laughs> yeah. Anybody have any questions? You know, if you don't think of them right now, there's two more sessions coming up. Uh, so if you join us and you, uh, like, like Bruce said, in a final session, we're going to be recapping some of this. And um, you're welcome to ask those questions at that time. Also, uh, at the end of the sessions, I will be sharing the PowerPoint presentation as well as the recordings of all of this. So if you feel like you have missed something, you can go back and revisit. Um, but uh, at this point, if there are no questions, I just want to thank you for your participation. As always, feel free to reach out to us. So in the chat here, I am going to put information on how to find your local PTAC, how to, how to get in touch with us. And uh, please do join us for the next two sessions. One is the sam.gov. Uh, walkthrough for those of you who are either already registered but are having issues or don't, but it's primarily geared toward the new registration. Uh, SAMDAGOV is undergoing many changes on a daily basis. And uh, so uh, please do join us. It's also an opportunity for you to ask questions. And then on Friday, we have a beginner's guide to marketing to government. As you see, there are so many opportunities um, out there and so many factors to consider. So narrowing down your uh, mar marketing approach is going to be uh, very important in your government procurement journey. Okay. So if no one has any questions, I wanna thank you all for joining us today and uh, you know how to find us. Feel free to reach out at any point. I'm surprised that Deborah didn't have questions. She usually has a lot of questions that are that always benefit the group. So, yeah, well, probably many are thinking, uh, "Geez, where do I start with the questions?" <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so, you know, I do encourage you before Friday's session just to go in and try to uh, search some of these things yourself. You know, once you actually begin this search journey, that's when the questions may come up. So use these uh, so resources we talked about today. And then on Friday, you may have some uh, more particular questions to ask us. But thank you, everyone, and have a great day.